Hello, my, uh, my name is Corey McCain, and um, I'll be giving a testimony on uh, that I was letting everybody know that I'm a former believer in peacekeeping, that this was something that uh, I originally did not believe, and then I came to believe, and now I no longer believe it. So I felt it was important to share some of this testimony, these thoughts of, in particular, what brought me into peacekeeping and what eventually led me to the conclusion I hold to now where I no longer believe in uh, peacekeeping. And I would like to start with, um, you know, I can remember when I was first studying the issue as an Adventist, coming into the church as a Seventh-day Adventist and being taught certain things and the, the, the background that I had and learned on the issue. And I remember becoming very, very troubled early on with some key passages uh, particular in Colossians, how we would interpret the handwriting of ordinances that were against us, which were contrary to us, along with other terminology. I would often hear people from the pul pulpit teach that, uh, you know, the reason we don't do these feasts is because they were bondage, and these were against us and they were contrary to us. And this really bothered me. And I remember in my own personal studies, numerous times going, make, trying to make a connection from Colossians 2 to, um, I believe it's in uh, Deuteronomy, uh, where the law of Moses, and it talks about, where it uses the term that is a witness against us. And I use this to try to show, hey, the law of Moses was against us, and the law of Moses was contrary to us. And I used to use it, and it, it began to trouble my mind, because I began to realize that, you know, I'm really teaching that God did something gave people something that was ba really bad for them and it put them into this very bad system of bondage and it really troubled my mind and so that is what initially led me into really investigating the the issue closer and I noticed the peacekeepers were not saying that obviously and I was like ah oh, these people are painting the character of God in the correct light they're not turning him into this uh, God that is you know putting people into bondage and so, as I studied this, and uh, there were some other things that I noticed. Uh, traditionally, as Adventists, we've taught that um, in the scriptures, there's the law of Moses and the law of God. The law of Moses is the ceremonial law, and the law of God is the moral law, and the ceremonial law, law of Moses is what was contrary to us and against us. And that's what's nailed to the cross. Well, as I studied through scripture, I began to notice that these terminology is used interchangeably, and it's all talking about the same thing. And the feast keepers taught this. So I recognized, hey, it seems like the feast keepers have the truth on these, these things. So I began to look at it, and as I studied, um, those were the two key, the, for me, those were the two key things that really um, put me into that direction of believing. And there are things that I agree with. The feast keepers, they, they're right on those particular issues. They have the correct points on that. And I think it's important to not only address peacekeepers in, in this particular testimony, but even non-peacekeepers to let people know that, hey, we need to make sure that we're explaining things correctly to people, that we're not leading other people astray, because it was those errors, I believe, that led me into the path that I had, I had gone down. Now, as I was in the peacekeeping camp, I was, re I was um, a firm believer in the feast for about one year of really thinking that, yes, these things are important, they're salvational, the latter rain is going to be connected to them, unity is going to be connected to them, and that, that these things are salvationally important. Over time, I began to notice some issues that I had in the peacekeeping camp and some beliefs and some things, interpretations and issues that I started to have on that side. So I'm, basically, I, I went from a position where I started to kind of back off from a, for a little bit for another year. I still thought there can be some importance to them, and I kind of came into a middle ground approach. approach. But I kind of was in a situation that's like, okay, the non feast keepers are saying this, and the feast keepers are saying this, and I have issues over here, and I have issues over here, and I need to solve these. So ultimately, as I began to study, I became um, more and more convinced in my mind that, you know what, this is a situation where, hey, guess what, the feast keepers have some truth over here on these points and the non-feast keepers have some truth over here on these points. But then I, I began to look at it and to a little bit depth, more depth to, to solve the issue for myself and wanting to know for my own self. And 
uh, because one of the things that really began to trouble my mind as I was a feast keeper was the issue of the timing of these feasts. Uh, when I came into, originally when I came into the feast keeping movement, uh, I was convinced from the scripture in my original study that uh, the barley harvest played a significant role in establishing the timing of these feasts throughout the year. And as I began to look at it, I, I, I was convicted that that was true, but I began to have a conviction that, well, this, isn't, this is a problem because this won't work on a global scale, especially because I believe Jesus Christ could have came during the 1800s. Well, the problem with the, as a feast keeper in believing the barley harvest, in the 1800s, you don't have modern technology to tell you when the barley is ready. So if the feasts are important in the second coming of Christ, then, and they had to come, the light had to come before Christ could come, then for me it was like, well, the, bar, the barley can't be right then. So everybody else, most of the Adventist peacekeeping community had adopted the, the first new moon after the equinox. And so I then adopted that and, and went with that for a, a while. But I began to be really troubled by it because I it looked in scripture and I've never found any evidence at all for this uh, concept of the first new moon after the equinox. And so that really troubled my mind about it. Um, another thing that troubled my mind, I remember a brother asking me questions about the statutes and judgments because as feast keepers, uh, it's very common to point out many, many passages that talk about keeping the statutes and judgments. Well, the, the problem in my mind that was fit, questioned me is, why don't I keep these statutes and judgments that I preach? And it, it's like, do, do I have an issue? And I started looking at it and I recognized that I was very, very inconsistent as I looked through uh, the law of Moses, because I'm saying that the law of Moses is very important. And in reality, what ended up boiled down to, I was saying, oh, just the feasts are important. And at that, I didn't even believe that we needed to dwell in booths or eat unleavened bread for a week. I just felt like the timing was important. So here I am preaching, all the statutes and judgments are really, really important, but it only boiled down to that the, the feast timing was important. Now there are some other feast keepers, they, there's a few other things that they would go a little bit further than I did, but I personally was con and, and confused and just overall in the feast keeping community seeing a, a lack of consistency in what's being presented, that these statutes and judgments are critically important. And so I began to recognize an inconsistency there. And from that point on, as I began to study these things, uh, I, did, I became more and more convinced that these things were not something that uh, God is trying to bring into the Three Angels message to finish up his work. And I decided to write a book on it this summer, and I've spent lots of time writing this book on it. And uh, in, in this particular book, I've dealt with some of the issues that have um, convinced me and brought me out of it. And one of them happened to be the issue over the barley harvest. And recognizing, going back to that, I began to notice that how these, har the, these festivals, they all revolved around the barley harvest. Uh, from beginning to end, it all revolves around that cycle. And that, along with the connection that God in the law had commanded th these things to be bound to where he would put his name, and which was obviously Jerusalem. And these things began to show me that these things were part of the Jewish economy. They were never intended, God never intended for the global economy. And I began to be troubled in order for it to work on the global economy, this seems to be why everybody's coming up with this idea of first new moon after the equinox, because there's nothing in the scriptures that teach it. But, uh, so, I addressed that in, in my book in, in some quite some detail. Uh, the other issue I, didn't I really didn't understand was what a shadow was. In Colossians 2, we see that the, the meat and drink and the festivals and the new moon and the Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come. Th this concept in my mind as a feast keeper, I believed, oh, this just simply means that we're going to be keeping these in heaven. We're going to keep all these things in heaven. And that's the understanding of a shadow. But 
as I began to sit down to write my book and go over it, I looked at the passages in Scripture to notice that a shadow is something that is cast from a body, a substance, is casting that shadow, and it's representing uh, something that that substance is going to fulfill. And, and recognizing that, I uh, went into a lot of detail in my book on, the, on this particular aspect and uh, came to the conclusion that all, all these things in the Old Testament that were given that were sh types and shadows, they're part of what's also called the ceremonial law. I prefer to call it light law of types and shadows because I think it, it makes it clearer for people to grasp the broadness of what is really a part of this. And these things, all of it, are cast from the shadow of Christ and when they met him at his substance, he then takes up and goes from that point, and he now is the one that ministers all of the reality of what those meant in their, in their shadowy form. And that is why they're no longer necessary, because when you, even when you go back and you look at those back in their day, they of themselves never had a sacrifice or anything. It never had any merit in of itself. It was always the faith in the one behind it that it pointed to that had the reality. God just used that to point to the reality. But when that reality has come, there is no longer a need to do that because it was never God's intention anyhow. So if we try to bring the, any type of law or uh, a type or a shadow in at this time, that's where we run into these issues that Paul was running into and dealing with circumcision and whatnot, that hey, Commanding this, don't you realize this never did any good for any of the people before in any way? It never had any value in it. The value was always in Christ. It only pointed to Him. And when we see that, any time we go and we begin to command people to keep types and shadows, we are actually ultimately, eventually leading a person away from Christ. Even though originally, you know, it may, you know, a person could be in error. They're not uh, necessarily rejecting Christ. But down the road, a continued walking in this direction uh, of preaching these things and teaching these things is no different than what the early church was doing with saying you must be circumcised. It will lead to the ultimate end th goal and this is what we see happening here in Adventism today. When we start to look at this, how does this, how does this impact us on a practical level of where I was with the believing of the feast to where I'm no longer believing in, in, in these feasts. Well, for me, practically, you know, I wasn't in it all that terribly long. I never really fought for it, uh, per se, to convince a lot of people, but I do know a lot of people that can get really wrapped up in spending a lot of time of concentrating and trying to prove this particular point. And I spent my fair share of time in it, too. But for me, the, the big thing is, is recognizing that, you know, God ultimately is wanting to unify the brethren and the father and son community to finish up this work in the world. And if I'm going and I'm preaching things that were never meant to be part of the three angels' messages, something like the feast that were never intended for the global economy, the global Christian economy, I'm putting th things on people that are actually going to cause disunity and actually cause problems and more division. Uh, so th when I recognize it from that aspect, I realize that you know, not only is it having a, a practical uh, issue with my own walk, but I'm now actually fighting against the Church of Christ. I'm actually fighting against the unity that Christ is trying to bring. Our problem since 1844 of why Christ has come, it doesn't have anything to do with feasts. It has everything to do with our connection to Christ and that he, all his end goal is, is to bring us to that character perfection that he has, that he's wanting to give us. He's wanting to restore us right back to where we were in Eden. And anything that we try to bring on top of that and add to it is going to cause division. And when, when I looked at division, I went through a period where I, where I fell away because I saw nothing but division in, in the church. And, and for me, it, it, I, didn't, I didn't see any, any hope in, in God being able to do anything with the division that's going on. And, but the, the reality was, of it, I was part of that division. 
from the walk that I was doing and I was right there in it. I was angry with everybody else for division, but I was part of it because of going down this particular path. And it's very easy to, uh, I, I told of being a former feast believer, I understand what feast, feast keepers see in this stuff because I understand the errors that we've traditionally taught, trying to teach people that these things are bondage and stuff like that. And, and recognizing, you know what, they're, they weren't. They're, they were, it was an excellent system for what they had. The Jewish economy worked perfect for what God had intended for at that time, but it was not designed for the global economy is what I noticed. And so on a personal impact, you know, it, it's now freeing me up to recognize that, you know, we do, we do have unity to work on. And um, these, it's going to happen through the camp meetings. And just like Alan White tells us in the Spirit of Prophecy, these camp meetings, they're God's appointed occasions for giving the early and the latter rain. Now, as a feast keeper, we recognize that the feasts are God's appointed times for giving the early and the latter rain. But Ellen White clearly says the camp meetings are God's appointed occasions for giving the early and latter rain. Well, if we receive, we're receiving the early and latter rain, it's because we're coming into unity. And these, this unity is ultimately going to be fought out amongst us as we gather together at these large camps and, and be able to work these things out. And I don't believe, from what I saw in the feastkeeping community, because there is no plain thus saith the Lord on the timing issue of this, or those that do recognize the truth of how can, closely the barley harvest is connected to it, it doesn't, the reasoning that this can be used in a global scale, is, I don't think it's very sound reasoning. And it's going to lead to more and more division in the, in the feastkeeping community. For those of you who are, are, are studying the feast, because everybody, if, if you come into the truth on the Father and Son or an Adventism in general, you're going to eventually be faced with this test. You're going to be faced with this test. Are the feasts real? Because it's, it's a growing movement. So you need to study it and these things for yourselves. You need to, to really grasp what you're getting into from the aspect of if you're going to teach people that the feasts are important, you have to understand that the foundation to the feast is in the timing. If you go and teach people that these feasts are important and you do not have a plain thus saith the Lord for the timing of these, of how it works, how the calendation works to establish these things, you're only going to be able to go out and teach a thus saith the man. You're not going to have a plain thus saith the Lord for, for your teaching. And that's at least that's the, the understanding I have come to in, in my study. So I think you really need to look at that particular aspect because I think that will teach you and show you that these feasts have had a local economy um, purpose for them, the Jewish economy. When you look at the, uh, the world today, you see uh, on the world economy, you see serious issues at the Passover time. You know, I live in Michigan. I went down to Passover last spring in, in Georgia, and there was no problem keeping Passover there for 100 plus people. But in Michigan, when I left, we had a foot of snow. The lakes were frozen. It was below 30 every night. You try to get to 100 people together, and it's like the lodging, the trying to set it up, to, and going out into the community to do evangelism. It just becomes very impractical. And then we're talking about Michigan. Try taking up into northern Canada or Alaska at that time of the year and see what happens. You're going to start to realize that, you know, this, yeah, this isn't very practical. And the reason it's not very practical is because God did not design it for the global scale like that. He de de designed it for the Jew Jewish economy. Another aspect that proves this, and we see that, is right now we are in the fall. And pe there are people that will be celebrating Feast of Tabernacles here in the fall, in the Northern Hemisphere. But in the Southern Hemisphere, it is spring right now. Are these people to keep Feast of Tabernacles in the spring and then keep Passover in the fall in their area? These, these things just, uh, they just, they're more evidence to just show you that these are really tied down to the Jewish economy and that God had never intended them. And if we take something that God had not intended for the global gospel and take it to the world, then we're really beginning to make, create our own gospel, our own way for people. So you really need to study that aspect. Another really important thing to do is really take all the passages, passages to do with a shadow. 
what a shadow is. Go through the, the spirit of prophecy in particular and look up the word shadow, shadowy, shadowed, all of these terms, type, typical. Look up all of these terms and see what they mean. You'll see a very, very clear concept that the spirit of prophecy and the scriptures are very clear that the entire law of types and shadows ceased with the body of Christ on the cross. It was no longer necessary. Yeah, from that point on in those early years, there, there can be people, uh, some of the members of the church, especially of the Jewish persuasion, continue to keep some of these things. It was not, I don't believe it was an issue at that time. You've got to understand a, a transition period from one economy to the next. There's going to be some overlap. People aren't just suddenly overnight going to cease doing everything that they've done for 2,000 years. It's just not going to happen. So there, God knew he needed time to be able to, to go through this stuff and work it out. Um, but really, really pay attention to what a shadow is and think about that. Think about this stuff on a global aspect and how this is going to affect. What is your plain thus saith the Lord for why you're teaching these things? And what does it mean to be a shadow? And, and you'll be able to keep the truth to recognize that, hey, these things were not bondage. They had a specific purpose. They were glorious in what God had intended them for at that time. But to take and bind people to these today at these specific times we're really going to end up setting up in a situation of, you know, take, uh, go back to my example in Alaska. Uh, if those times are binding, you bring some people together at the spring and the fall festival at that time, um, and they're hampered because of the weather to be able to do anything, does it make any practical, is there any practical sense in that, that, oh, but in the summertime when it gets nice, they can then hold camps and do stuff in the camp. Well, think that about it. Most people don't necessarily have the opportunity to come together three or four large gatherings in a year. Some people do, but not everybody. And not only that, it's not cheap to set up these large gatherings. So to do, if you're already doing two, you're gonna use up the finances. And that, we are stewards of God's money. When you are stewards of God's money, we are responsible for how we use it. And if we're using it in, in times like that, where we're able to do no practical good, we are wasting our Father's money. Where we could have just recognized that, you know what, he didn't intend this for the global gospel. It's meant for the, uh, right now in the Christian economy, God has set, given us camp meetings to do all these things. And when the weather is right in your particular climate, you can set up these things, bring people in, and we can go out into the community and do evangelism based on our circumstances of what's happening. And Christ, in that work, he's going to perfect our character. Our issue of character perfection is not because we happen to uh, be getting together during a week in April or a week in October. It's going to be more about our effort and our work with Christ to go out and reach souls for him. And anything that is coming in the way that is causing unity, disunity amongst us, is going to be a problem. And it's going to be something that you really have to consider as you begin to look at these things.